Ah, não tem ninguém ouvindo, ouvindo nem assistindo. Você fala não. <risos> Pessoal, a gente está um pouquinho atrasado, mas em cinco minutinhos a gente já começa, tá bom? Vocês fazem isso aí tudo, né? Pegar essa aqui então, professor. Ah, ela, ela vai ser. É melhor que ela tenha essa na mesa, não, professor. Olha lá, não.
I think it's really important to measure handling. Because a big frustration for me is I would put in a new piece of equipment, either into a meat factory or into a ranch. Then I'd work and get the handling, just perfect, perfect. Then a year later, I'd come back and sticks are back out and yelling and screaming and hitting and running cattle. And what had happened is they slowly went back to bad and they did not realize it. And that's why it's so important to measure things like slipping, falling, poking with sticks, yelling, cattle hitting things, mooing and vocalization in the, in the restrainer. Because then I can tell, is the handling getting better? Or is the handling getting worse? It's just like traffic. Speed limit is controlled because the police are uh, out there measuring it. Um, another thing, I think there's a lot of opportunities, especially since Brazil is an exporting country, to um, uh, produce uh, pigs and cattle for some of the high-end markets, like grass-fed, organic, um, free-range, uh, cage-free chickens, a lot of these specialized markets. That's something that would be a good thing for, uh, you know, that you could get into doing. You know, a lot of exciting things. You've got a young industry here. I like seeing so many young people uh, going into it. Maybe we can just do some questions now. Okay. Um, so we will start with the questions. Questions from the, the meeting. From the meeting and someone, if someone have another one or from the internet, also we can if Tempo feels the question has been answered already, she well, says Well, I no. put these one have been answered already, pull yeah. those ones yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we we'll start with this one. Uh, how could you minimize the stress of females, especially cows, when the reproductive uh, handling, when you talk about artificial insemination? There is an option to decrease the stress with this kind of handling. Well, if you get animals, have animals walk quietly through the corrals. Some research in the, in the U.S. showed that acclimating um, animals to moving through the corrals help conception rates. It's very important that the animal's first experience with the corrals is good. And so maybe just bring them in and feed them in some of the holding pens in the corrals. Let them walk through the facility. You don't do anything to them. Feed them. And they come out of the facility. There's also a big difference in animal temperament. We saw that yesterday, the cattle handling demonstration, we had a purebred minorities, and then there was a black animal, it was a crossbred, it was only part indicus. And she was much calmer. She was in with the other cattle. And you could really see the difference in the behavior. And that's genetics, because they have had the same branch, same experience. Uh, same people and you have to be really careful with the animal that has a more fearful temperament because you can make it go through the facility and you can get worse because you're frightening that black animal she was um, we used her four times with an lorry we used a fresh group of cattle each time because they get more upset easily you see so genetics interacts with on uh, things that we do to them. And an animal that gets frightened more easily, we've got to be more careful. Uh, but, and animals also are specific in their, in their way they look at things. Uh, if you have animals where they've only been handled on a horse, they can get really frightened when they, when, I'm sorry, I'm going to sneeze. They can get really frightened when they are handled by a person on the ground. Horse is familiar and safe, person on the ground, scary and frightening. And that's also very dangerous for people because the flight zone can instantly enlarge. It's really important out on the ranch, the pasture, that they learn how to go in and out of pens with a person walking. So when they go to sale barns and they go uh, to meat plants and feed yards, other places, uh, they'll know how to react to the person walking. See, person on the horse, person on the ground, Two very different pictures. 
there's one here, then I have a question. No, so the next one, it's about a flock. When you have a big flock and you need to split. Flock about sheep, cattle? Or cattle. Okay. And then you need to split. Huh? And it's herd, not flock. Oh, herd. herd. Well, yeah. okay, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, herd. just know that it's uh, cattle. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I have a herd and you have to split for handling or whatever in a shoot, how much time did the animals take to reorganize socially uh, to determine a leader, for example? How can you... Can, how can you identify the leader of the herd? Well, the leader animal that walks out in front of the herd is a different animal than the animal that is dominant, pushing other animals away from the feeder. Uh, if you have a whole herd of cattle, the dominant animal that will shove other animals away will actually be in the center of the herd because if we, that's an anti-predator base. That's the safest place. The animal that leads the herd tends to be a low fear and a curious animal gets out there in front. That's not the dominant animal at the feed trough. And it does take some time to reorganize the social group several days. Now you bring cattle into a, into a system and they're, uh, and they're stirred up, it takes about half an hour to calm down. Now Prentice DeCosta gave a talk and he brought up a point that I think was really important <coughs> If you have a very big herd of Nalori, like maybe a thousand of them or five hundred of them, bring only one hundred to two hundred into the crowds and leave the rest out in some pastures so they're not getting all stressed because it's really stressful to have seven hundred cattle shoved together in a pen in, in the crowds while the other cattle being worked. And I thought that was a really good point. At the workshop, we could see very clearly when the lorry started to get stressed because they started pooping on themselves, um, switching their tails. Uh, you could also see when they calmed down and there was individual differences within the herd where one animal was pooping and switching its tail, the other one was eating some grass. Again, that's differences in the individual differences within the group of the same breed on the same ranch. Uh, another question is about the meat production, the farm animals. Uh, the point of view of animal welfare, uh, which species have the best welfare, in your opinion, about meat and also milk and uh, egg production? Well, just think of a good way to answer that is to explain what's happened with the OIE. I was on the World Animal Health Organization uh, ad hoc slaughter committee. And that was the very first OIE guideline that got done. And one of the reasons for that is the slaughterhouses are pretty much the same around the world in terms of the things that they have to do. And the second guideline was transport. And then they did depopulation. Then they did uh, beef and dairy cattle and broiler chicken. And they still have not done laying hen and pork. And the reason for that is there were many more controversial issues about the housing, such as South Station stalls and hen cages. And it's very difficult to get all the countries in the OIE to sign off on it. And it's still not uh, not done. Now, I think there's going to be a trend away from small cages. More and more supermarkets and large buyers are asking for cage free. And some of our producers in the U.S. have come up with some very innovative ways to do a cage free that's still really efficient. We've got to let people innovate. Um, so some good things are going on with the hens. People are also, some people now moving away from South of Station stalls. And it's going to be really important to have the right genetics of pig in those stalls. There are certain genetic lines of cells that are very aggressive and very bad on fighting. Mm -hmm. And recently I went to an indoor, it's completely concrete, uh, a farm back at home, and they had uh, bred a genetics, it's much more gentle. Instead of like biting the boots like this, they would just go like this. It solved a lot of fighting problems. There's some design things that have been worked out. For example, if you have an electronic sow feeder, it's really important to have a long alley, maybe uh, 10 meters long, so the pig, when she goes through the feeder, walks all the way down and she can't run back. With no long alley, come around like this back to the end, she up against that. Also, large groups fight less. And 
have a wide alley so that pigs that uh, don't like each other can stay two meters apart when they're walking from one end of the barn to the other. And then also set up living room partitions or bedroom partitions. And groups of cells are in here and in here, and they set up their little society. So you need to have the bedroom partitions, big wide alley, and a long exit. And those seem to be three things that um, people have kind of just independently have figured out. And the genetics. There are some genetics uh, just will not work in group indoor housing. They are just too aggressive. Yeah, the other question is exactly about, about uh, ask about the genetic improvement for this kind of characteristics that you should be selected. And uh, what do you think about the research on animal welfare? It's so focused in a specific issue, or you think it's also have general research on it? Well, you have to work on specific problems. You know, someone will say, well, does this system respect the animal's welfare? Well, I don't really know how to define it. And I've worked a lot with commercial people and where we have to decide, does this particular farm comply with our standard? And I have no way that I can audit or inspect, respect the animal's welfare. I can specify a certain type of housing. I also want to be measuring things like lameness because there's been a lot of problems where you just did selection for meat quality traits and pigs and cattle started being lame. We need to measure that lameness, that difficulty walking, so that problem we can work on improving the body condition score, dirtiness, swollen legs. Uh, you have to do those basics. Health's a very important part of welfare, but it's not the only thing. You have to do more than just more than just health in order to have have good animal welfare. But I have found that a lot of standards are way too vague. Because if I I have to have something where I know what you mean by respect for the animal. I think in the future, a lot of welfare things around the world are going to get driven by the commercial sector. Customers asking for certain things. They get a GAP program, and you have certified humane, other programs specify certain things. And they have to specify clear things. So I can determine, does this farm actually comply with this or not? Because people get angry when they get removed from the approved supplier list. So I have to have something really clear. You can't say, give the pigs enough space. I don't know what that means. I Basically, as far as leverage at the packing plant or at the meat factory, enough space for overnight is all the animals able to cattle to lay down at the same time. Pigs always have to have enough space for all the animals to lay down at the same time. That I can measure. I know a simple way to measure how many broilers are in a building, is I can't count them. And people have a tendency sometimes to fake records. Is market ready? The day they're going to be picked up, walk in there, and the chickens move this far away without uh, piling? Because if they can't, there's too many birds in the building. I like really nice, simple ways to measure things. <laughs> Can I ask yeah, this first? Well, uh, I do not have the opportunity to watch all of our lectures, but I would like to know how is the best way for us students and young professionals to approach farms and commercial farms and convincing them that uh, cattle handling and many well, I would do. Important is find farm managers that are really interested. It's very important when you introduce something new that your early adopters, it works. It's really important. And you're going to need to have management that cares. When I started out my business on designing equipment, it was one branch at a time. And then I would write about it. You have a success out on a farm, write about it. Professional publications, veterinary and animal science, but also cattle magazines, or if it's chicken or pig magazines. Get it out there to people. I, one of the things you need to do is go to producer meetings. 
pig meetings, chicken meetings, cattle meetings. And you'll get to meet people and then you find somebody that wants to work with you. I now, you know, handling is getting better. One of the things that has made handling get better is the fear of this. <laughs> because we've had some issues where some videos got shown of uh, people stomping and throwing boilers, uh, very bad beating of pigs with metal rods, some very bad things. And then pig farms that are owned by big corporations will start working on training and they've got to get that stuff stopped. But there's also people that have discovered that good handling really does pay. Another factor I've used is uh, accidents to people. We have very expensive insurance that companies have to buy for uh, accidents to people. And cattle can cause some really bad accidents when they're fearful and scared. But you start out one thing at a time and write about it. Okay, what is your animal? Which animal do you work with? Uh, dairy cattle. Dairy cattle? Yes. Well, I would just find some dairies that be willing to work with you. You've got to get, you have to get management that cares. I've had too many places where the manager just is sort of, the, we have a word we call it, giving it lip service. Uh, it's, uh, man, they talk really good, but they don't do it. I don't want to work with that kind. I want to find a manager that really cares. Even back years ago, when things were really bad, there were a few places that did things right, that kept me going. But find dairy managers that are really innovative, that you can do things with. But you're going to have to, I would put the next dairy conference, farmers conference on your calendar and be there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, a question, it's about actions with live animals. What do you think about the actions with live animals? Now, some of the worst handling happens in auctions. I, what's happening at home, when I first started in the 70s, large amounts of our market animals, you know, finished animals going to slaughter, went through auctions. Now, that's, they're almost all direct marketed. And from a handling standpoint, that's much better. We also are doing some video auctions right now. And that avoids the stress. I, but when it comes to the sector still probably with worst handling, it's auctions. And they have less of an interest because they don't own the animal. This brings up another important thing, economic accountability. The first research projects I ever did, I looked at feedlot, fattened cattle, I looked at bruises, and I looked at bruises where you sell them live and if they have a bruise, the meat factory, the slaughterhouse, pays for that bruise. Or you sell them on the rail, and if they have a bruise, the producer paid for it. And when the producer had to pay for bruises, and he was responsible for something bad the truckers did, when the producer had to pay for bruises, there was half as many bruises even though that study is very old, economic accountability works like magic. <laughs> when I worked on the McDonald's audits and we did the scoring system, percent stunned on the first shot, percent insensible, that had to be 100%, stunning score would be 95% on a single shot, and instantly shoot again, vocalization score, 5% or less in the box, that applies to kosher too, that's a problem area still. Falling down and electric goad use and pointed sticks also are in that same category. And I found one two days ago and we threw it away. That's another thing that just can't be doing that. And we went out to a whole lot of abattoirs, a whole lot of slaughterhouses in the US, and and they they had to get to their numbers or they'd be taken off the approved supplier list. It worked fabulous because the slaughterhouse or the meat factory 
knew exactly what it had to do. It was clear like traffic rules. And when you have a big customer like McDonald's doing it, and the first six months, two big factories were kicked off the approved supplier list. People got serious. Economic incentive. And the good news on a lot of the handling and slaughter stuff, you can take some older facilities that are not very good and with some repairs get have a you know good handle. With captive bolt stunning, the number one problem was lack of maintenance. They did not repair the gun. And and you also have to have enough air supply for the gun. There's been problems here with not enough air supply. You've got to have a good gun. You can have the best trained person, but if your gun is not enough air or broken, there's no way you're going to have a good study. But again, economic incentive. But the plant managers knew exactly what they had to do. It's like speed limits and stop signs. It was clear. Any questions? No. Uh, what's your opinion about dark house for broilers? Because in Brazil, some places they are starting to use yes. and have some complaints about some um, uh, technicians. Well, I don't know how you see the birds doing inspecting in the dark. Yes, I have seen that. I don't like it. I've been in houses that were so dark that even after I was in there for 20 minutes, I could not see the water lines and the feeders. And I would walk around in there and fall over the water lines and the feeders. And I had really good night vision. No, I don't like that kind of stuff. I think we have to look at everything we do and say, if I brought 10 people, just regular people from the city or some people out of the airport and we showed them that, I think they're going to be horrified. I have taken people through good slaughterhouses and they kind of go, oh, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. And we have videos now, beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin, pork plant video tour, and turkey plant video tour, and lamb plant video tour that show how it works. And a well-run slaughterhouse can pass that test. Dark chicken houses? Mm -mm. No. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. So no, you don't like it. The the dark, dark room. I don't know how you can inspect the birds or do. The other thing is, you want to have environments where your stock people, your animal care people, care about their animals. I mean, it puts your animals in dark holes. <laughs> no, it doesn't really. Um, it's not a place I want to work. <laughs> Okay, I no, I've got to be able to, the, of modern chicken houses, I've got a real simple thing. If I can't see the eyes on the birds, then it's too dark, period. Yeah. I like nice, simple things. And on space, people, I have found on record keeping, people cheat, people lie. Um, I, I train animal welfare auditors. I am a taco trainer in the U.S. And I have seen every way there's to cheat on records. I've taught them doing it. And my emphasis in auditing is on things I can directly see. Because records can be faked. And how can I count how many broilers in a building? So that's the reason why I like my tests where I walk through the birds and move a meter away with no piloting. And the place that had this dark chicken house had so many chickens jammed in there. The walking through there was impossible. And the reason why they wanted it dark was so they could overstuff this building and not put in another line of feeders and waters. Yeah, I signed a confidentiality agreement, so I can't tell you where it's <laughs> except it is in the US. Yeah. That's all I can say. And there's a point if pushing systems too hard. The other thing I can tell when I go in a broiler house. 
is whether or not the farmer actually walked to the far end of the building. Because I've been in buildings where you come up to the door and the birds are tame. And then I walk way to the far end of the house and the birds are crazy and piling up because the farmer never walked to the other end of that building to check anything. The birds will tell me. Half grown birds, three quarter grown birds, easy, easy to tell. That's the kind of stuff I'll look at. Ammonia levels is another critical control point on indoor animal, indoor anything. Ammonia levels. Yes, they cheat on that. And they play with the ventilation before I can get in there. Well, I make sure I get standing in front of the ventilation control. And I don't, I don't just go into somebody's chicken house, but I'll go in the, oh, the little hallway where the controls are, and I'll just put my back to the ventilation controls so they can't change them until I have put my head in there. Because another area where somebody's going to get in a lot of trouble if I'm running a supply chain is high ammonia levels. Dirty birds. Okay, what are the things that I can audit at the slaughterhouse for broiler? Dirty birds. Filthy, dirty, disgusting birds. There's a nice scoring system on welfare quality. You can get it online. Hawk, hawk burn, hawk burn, foot pad lesions, and breast blisters. And I do I can do those after the birds are scalded. I can also score broken wings mm -hmm. for catching problems. When a bird is hung on the chain with feathers on, the broken wing hangs down. Easy things to measure. Also measure broken uh, cages for transport <coughs> containers. Easy things to measure. thing about broiler is most of the welfare issues I can measure at the slaughterhouse. That's not true for the other animals. Mm -hmm. Because they get high enough ammonia, their eyes are going to be damaged. Lungs are going to be damaged. So, in certain the, the question four, before four, do you think the, the chicken broilers, they, they have the worst welfare? Well, the other thing you want to look at in broilers, so there's, there's been problems with legs and lameness. I can measure that. I can measure twisted leg at the slaughterhouse. I can also lameness score chickens. It, it, it's, it's not possible to do it at the slaughterhouse because the birds get too scared to walk. But out on the farm, I can take some little fence panels and put some chickens in there and just walk them out through the walk them, make them walk out through a gate. Yeah, and it's easy to score on. Not able to walk. Uh, walks 10 paces, you know, straight, and walks uh, 10 paces crooked. So I've got, uh, you know, normal, lame, and down, basically. No, they're, I can definitely pick out what's bad welfare in broilers pretty easily. And they, and in the cold climates, now in the very, very cold climates, there's problems with the ventilation rate being slowed down and the litter gets all wet and muddy. <coughs> and then the birds are dirty. Yeah. And there's a welfare quality scoring card for dirty broilers. Yeah, the birds should be clean. This is just one of the basics. Yeah. Also, it's a reflect about the bed quality. Exactly. If the bed quality is bad, birds will be dirty. Birds will have breast blisters. Birds will have hot burn. Foot pad lesions. Yeah. Probably on their feet. Now, literally, the, you can measure the, the damage. Mm -hmm. And that gives a good measure of litter quality. Uh, this question is about the laying hands and uh, gestation sucks. Uh, how it's going the transition, the transition between the battery caves to free range system to cage free system in the US and about the crates from gestation Well, sucks. what's happening is it's being driven by large 
meat buyers. You, that you have to remember in the egg market, you have two parts of the egg market. Your shell egg, which you buy in a carton of eggs, and then a liquid egg that goes into bakery products like these cakes that we had at lunch. And they, um, oh, you got my book there, right? <laughs> And they, they um, shell, the, the liquid egg people are less fussy, less concerned than the shell egg. So we have a lot of hens still in small cages. The consumers are driving it. Sure, that we go into systems that are going to work. You might want to look up an article online, it's called Free Bird. You'll have to look it up in English. Free Bird in Fortune magazine. And it shows a McDonald's uh, cage-free system. And what they did is they took a colony, an enriched colony house, and took the doors off. And then the birds can live, you know, or they fly back and forth. And, and they did an innovation. I uh, put a little rod along the front edge of the, of the deck so the birds grip and they don't crash land. They solved that problem. But there's some very innovative things going on. Now, the scientific research showed that the cage-free system was a dirty mess, basically. But they've been, they found out a way to solve some of those problems. The dirty eggs, dirty air, the death loss problem uh, is way better. You know, that, a lot of that's crash landings. You know, getting that problem, getting that problem fixed. Um, the thing we have to be careful about is not to force a farmer to do something that doesn't work. You can say cage-free, and there's a lot of different things you can do that would be cage-free. There was an issue in England where a, a poultry a slaughterhouse was forced to do a stunning, put in a very expensive stunning system that did not work. Now, we don't want to do that. You know, I'd rather say you have to be cage free. And let people innovate on some of the things they can do because our producers have done some very clever things. Uh, someone has a question? Maybe. 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 I'm so sorry. My daughter is here and I, I try to speak in English and I have a, how can I say, a okay? So, so short to, to speak in English. I apologize. That's okay. I work with fish, stress okay. and welfare in fish. And uh, I would like to, to tell you that I'm not feeling like a fish outside water here. But the, the fish are always uh, neg 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 neglected. neglected. I, I would like to, to tell you I'm trying to improve in the welfare in fish. And study and study the the pen and fish and try to improve the, the laboratory conditions because this is one way to uh, homogenize. Standardize. Standard air. Yeah. Now what the, the, the results of the are research you at handling, stunning, of uh, how they're raised. And you're doing stunning, killing the fish. Yes, handling the fish, transport to... the fish. What are you? Uh, what part of it are you looking at? Mm -hmm. I work with, with a uh, anesthesi, anesthesi in fish, anesthesia, anesthesia for for slaughter. Uh, in when you kill the fish, the food for handling, for uh, surgery, for something like this. Okay. Uh, to uh, uh, let the yeah, uh, you're going to have to translate for me. Yes. This is the research, right? In research. Yeah. She uses fish in research. Oh, in research, research. Yeah. Yeah. not in commercial. Not okay. commercial. But she's concerned with the fact that we didn't forget about fish. It's not much part of our, our discussion in terms of welfare. Well, you, get, you see, the basic question is at what point does the nervous system become simple enough? That uh, oyster welfare, I don't think we have to worry about. There's just not enough nervous system there. 
or scallop welfare. I uh, fish have a bit have more brain. I have looked at some of the research. They'll have some EEG uh, patterns. Yes. Um, they there's no stress hormones react the same way. Where insects have no pain receptors. You know, fish do. Um, that's that's a big question. Yes. Even in humans, like 20 years ago, they used to do open heart surgery on human babies with just paralytic agents, which is completely awful. But that was done as recently as 20 years ago. Fish can ex express the band localization. Well, I think so. When I talk to students about pain or to producers about pain, I tell them about the self-medication experiments. A rat or chicken, the joint is injured, will eat or drink nasty, bitter tasting pain relief medicine. And then as it heals, they'll switch to the regular food or the regular water. So that shows me that they'll eat something bitter that tastes bad to relieve the pain. That research needs to be done in fish. Yes. Uh, you probably know. I noticed the carp in the pool out here. Come right up with the mouth out. Yeah. Well, you could have something where when they do that, it'll drop the, the stuff into their mouth. I, uh, you probably could do, do those. You know, animals do that experiment quite easily. Fish that will come up like that, completely out of the water, and then you know it's getting a full dose. The self-medication experiment needs to be done in fish. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think we have the last question. Okay. It's about the transport, the transport in cattle. How do you think it's the the, the should be the length of the transport and should the left the farm and should the slaughterhouse? Well, that's a very big the question. Maximum length of the duration. Well, these are big questions. Even on the OIE standards, uh, there was a lot of uh, questions about space requirements. Uh, Canada's regulations, Canada tends to have, do sensible things, it's 48 hours, 48. absolute maximum, and and case is 24. Uh, you have to make sure that when you do a rest stop, it's not a stress stop, mm -hmm. because when you have animals in a wild, Loading and unloading is, can be the most stressful part of the trip. Tame cattle, loading and unloading is nothing. It's like us getting on and getting out of the car. Tame cattle, it used to it. There's some very good work done by a lady named Schwartzworth Ginsburg. <coughs> Don't ask me how to spell it. <laughs> uh, in Canada, on our Bostaurus cattle. Mm -hmm. And where she does the research, there's no indicus blood. Far enough north to be, you know, in this. You might want to look up some of those studies. But this is, gets very contentious now. I think some of the stuff in Europe has gotten too strict. Every nine hours. I, I believe in having good animal welfare, but we also have to do things that are reasonable. So, to try to Dr. Green, uh, the system and the HACCP for food safety, do you think that uh, this can be uh, adapted to use with animal square separation? You mean uh, the food safety? I don't understand the question. HACCP, a uh, hard analysis point of control. ATP, the measurement of the substance, ATP? Exactly. Yes, yes, well, I don't understand. <laughs> Hazard. Oh, hazard analysis, critical control. Yes. Okay, okay, yes, I know what that is. Well, I actually like that principle because the principle of HACCP, we call it hazard analysis, critical control points, yes. is you pick out what are the relatively few important things to measure. I did that in my book, Improving Animal Welfare, a practical approach. You can't measure everything. And some of the other welfare systems that have been developed are too complicated. So then you have a situation where uh, 
They used a complicated scoring method and a dairy with 27% lame cows passed an audit. No way. Lameness is a critical control point. If, you, if people are you know, beating animals up, that's a critical control point. You don't do that. When I do the AMI scoring system, there's five things you measure plus acts of abuse. So that's six critical control points. You have to pass on all five of those. Stunning score, 95%. Uh, unconscious on the rail, 100%, vocalization, 5%, falling, 1%, electric prods or pointed sticks, uh, the pointed sticks shouldn't be any, but you want excellent score, that's down to 5%. Um, and all five of those numbers are critical control point. But that's not 100 things. It took our industry a long time to figure out on the slaughter floor that skinning out back legs was a major critical control point in hide removal. Because uh, you've got the dirty, uh, dirty hide, the fur, going against the meat. So in most of our factories, that's a very precision part of the process. It's a critical control point. Also gutting, so you don't cut the innards. Another critical control point. Um, it's not a hundred things. You see, it's figuring out what's really important. Let's go back to our traffic. Let's apply HACCP to traffic. And I can only enforce five traffic rules. There's three traffic rules. that are the most important to get the most public safety. And when I ask this question to people, they'll you might ask them to tell me which ones. They'll say speeding, they get that, and stopping, red light and stop sign violations. But I usually have to push to get them to tell me the most important one, drunk driving. Drunk driving. And then texting, we've now learned how dangerous that is. You know, the phone, on the phone, and seat belts. And if you enforce those five things, you'll have 95% of the public safety. That's the HACCP approach. Now the police spend most of the time enforcing those things. Yes, you can apply that to animal welfare. Uh, ammonia levels in indoor animals. Uh, we don't have anything to write on in here. Uh, yeah, ammonia levels for indoor animals is critical control point. Lameness, sores and, and swollen joints. They're dirty. Handling. And then we've got about five things you score on handling. Handling is a critical control point. I, and I've got a little bit of that in there. I have a lot more on this on Grandin.com. It's my last name. Grandin.com. You just have to make sure you spell it right. And I talk about um, HACCP principles. You can apply it because the problem with a lot of animal welfare evaluation, they're getting too complicated. All this subjective stuff like, you know, uh, preventable, su avoidable suffering. I don't know what that means. See, I'm used to commercial stuff. I have to decide, does this farm stay on my approved supplier list or do I remove this farm? So I also have legal issues here. And I have to have a clear reason to take the farm off the approved supplier list. It's that simple. And avoidable suffering is not hold up in court. And you mentioned about this uh, legal, legal issue. Well, yeah, but legal, the way to deal with legal is to have it clear. Okay. I'm running a meat factory. Okay, let's take this kosher factory right now. It's a failed audit right now. 100% vocalization score. They bought some really nice equipment, messed it all up. It doesn't fit humped cattle. Uh, and that has to be fixed. Now, I've fixed a lot of equipment. I think I can probably fix it without totally wrecking everything. Uh, but they've got to get that vocalization score down to 5% because they're torturing those cattle. It's that simple. And there's scientific research. This is where science comes in to show that vocalization is a valid score of suffering. Because their cortisol is going way up. 
pigs are screaming, lactates go up, glucose goes up, you can get biological measures there. And also, papers I did, is that 99% of the cattle vocalizations during handling were caused by electric prods, too much pressure, a sharp thing poking them, <coughs> slamming doors on them, bad things happened, that made those cattle vocalize. And when I fix the bad things, the vocalization score goes down. Uh, less, a month ago, uh, Mike Mendel from Bristol and James Serpo from the University of Pennsylvania were in Brazil. And they went close to some farms and they asked me the question whether or not the uh, Indicus cattle vocalized less than the European breeds. And, and I think that's probably correct. Well, when you squash them with restraint equipment, the lorries vocalize. Vocalize. Yes, I've talked to some people, and since we're on a recorder, I am not going to say the name of the plant. Then you get vocalization. Torture the lorry. and the lorry cattle, they vocalize. Okay. And, and uh, it may be less. Less, okay. Now, the thing that vocalization scoring does is it prevents really bad stuff. And I find when I fix things, like too much hydraulic pressure, you break a jaw on an animal, and yeah. uh, the other thing you can look at is I move for damage on the animals. I find a broken jaw in, in, from a head holder, somebody's failing on it, they fail real fast. If I find equipment inflicted damage on the animals, it, it's, but they've got to get that score down. Maybe the lorries tolerate a bit more, but they don't tolerate being smashed and having things stuck into them. And, but I have to have something clear. And then the other thing that made it work, if I, if I were to go to that factory, if I spent a week in that factory and I had a good hydraulic person and a good uh, uh, welding and millwright person and a good translator, I'd have to have that. We could, I'll, I would find out when I went in there that I can either fix it really cheaply by getting separate pressure controls, different parts of the equipment, um, or it might be an expensive mess to fix. I wouldn't know until I went in there. But when I'm in welfare mode, I will try to fix it the cheap way and get good scores. And we learned, and, um, and when we did those McDonald's odds, we took some old plants, old kind of dumpy plants, and we, we fixed them with a lot of maintenance and repairs, and we got them to work decently. I know one thing, we got to build a new head holder for that box. That's the first thing we got to do. And the next thing I'm probably going to have to do is get some separate pressure controls so they're not squeezing them too hard. Hopefully that will all I have to do to fix it. But I'm, I'm approaching kind of a different way. You see, I have a lot of engineering background, so I know how to fix the equipment. And I also have to be in a situation where I'm running a supply chain. I have to make a decision. What do I do with that plant? No, they failed order. Now they got to get that fixed because I don't want their kosher hind ends in my product. Right. That I don't 